like a homecoming, not only because my, I grew up in Wellesley and I was with my uh, parents yesterday, uh, not only because Gary Hirschberg, uh, the CEO of uh, Stony Field, was on our board, as well as Jeff Swartz, the uh, CEO of Timberland, was on our board. Turn it on. Um, but also because uh, the mindset that you all share is exactly the mindset that, that I brought to Honesty. And so to be able to be in this room and, and share this both this moment in our in our economy in our economy's uh, history and our nation's history is, is an important one. And so I'm really glad to be here. Um, it's true that I grew up in Wellesley. I am now living in Washington, D.C. And it's been a little bit of a uh, unusual place to be over the past year, Washington, D.C. You know, we had the government shut down. It was kind of dispiriting, um, depressing for me to feel like we were so dysfunctional. We literally had to shut the government down. And, and um, there was one uplifting moment, though, I wanted to share with you that came from that whole uh, moment. It was when President Obama signed the order to make sure the military was going to get paid. They caught a picture of it, and you'll see over on the corner of the Resolute <laughs> desk, there's a bottle of honest tea. Yeah. Now, <laughs> there were a few different reactions people had to this picture. My wife's reaction was, oh my gosh, there's no coaster on the, on the Resolute desk. <laughs> Maybe we should, you know, buy you know, the, him some coasters. I said, I bet you they have coasters there. Uh, then, of course, someone in marketing said, well, you know, that bottle, the tea's not facing. Maybe we could just rotate it. I said, well, that, that wouldn't be honest to do that. Uh, of course, the other thought was that, um, you know, it's interesting. You don't often see presidents with uh, brands, right? Their, their handlers are pretty meticulous about not letting the, you know, someone sort of saying there's an endorsement there. But um, I think we know that Honest Tea is stocked in the uh, Oval Office refrigerator, and so it's nice to, to have it uh, documented there. Now, I realize not everybody is going to feel that's the right kind of person to endorse, so I wanted to also share with you an image from somebody who I think is universally uh, admired, and this was um, uh, back in uh, when uh, <laughs> the Red Sox were on their way to the World Series uh, in 2007. Um, I had written a blog about how being a Red Sox fan was the perfect training to be an entrepreneur because growing up I learned to deal with rejection and to bounce back and, and somehow that made it to Carl Yastrzemski and so here it says to Seth, honest tea is the best, Carl Yastrzemski Hall of Fame 1989, so um, we're, we're making sure we cover all the bases here. <laughs> all right, so I want to talk to you a bit today about what we've been doing at Honest Tea, and I want to share with you the journey that we've been on, and the, um, what the book captures is the first 10 years, but now, the, you know, sort of what happened after we sold to Coca-Cola, and, and the journey we continue to be on as we try to scale this mission-driven business. First of all, I want to take you back to where our, um, our tea leaves come from, to, to, to go to the source. We always, you know, for, for us, um, we are primarily a tea company, so we always think about how do we connect with these communities we source from, what can we learn from them, and I want to share with you some of the learnings that I've gotten. So the first one is from a um, community in China, in uh, south central China, kind of called Anhui province. It's a relatively poor province, and I got there a few years ago, and um, we had driven, flown a long way, and then driven a long way, flown again, driven again, and eventually we get out of the car, and these are my hosts taking me down a path. And I will admit, I was probably a little impatient and traveled this far, let's go see these tea leaves, these tea bushes. And instead of leading me into a garden or to a field of tea bushes, they lead me to uh, the edge of a river. And I'm looking around, I don't see a bridge, I don't see any tea bushes, and, and I say, well, we are here to see tea bushes. And I'm wondering in the back of, in my mind if I'm in one of these Zen parables where you know, you've already been with the tea bushes, you just didn't know they were you know, connected to. <laughs> and they said, no, no, well, the, the, you know, the, the tea bushes are across the river. And I said, well, you know, have you thought about building a bridge? Usually in commerce, you want to be connected from you know, the goods to the market. And they gave me four interesting reasons why they didn't build a bridge. So number one, they're a poor province. They can't just put up a bridge just because that would you know, be a ec economically expedient. Number two, there's a lot of flooding in this part of China. And so the bridge might be underwater at one point of, of the year and uh, you know, uh, far away from land at another point. Number three, there's, it's an organic tea garden, so there's no need for heavy equipment or large bags of chemicals. But the most interesting thing they said was, if we build a bridge, then we'll need a road. And if we have a road, then there'll be infrastructure. And if we have infrastructure, there'll be pollution. So instead of a bridge, this guy came up in a bamboo raft. We got our feet a little bit wet, but we ended up in the tea garden. And for me, the whole um, way of thinking really changed the, uh, it sort of enlightened, it sort of expanded my mind. So I saw a problem, right? The problem was no bridge. But for this community, no bridge was a solution. 
You know, we're in a they're in a country with runaway development, with you know, runaway pollution. How do you protect your source? And for them, not having a bridge was a way to protect the source. And you think about our society, we're such a solution-oriented society, and, and obviously for me, I go to agriculture. We see pests in a field, we see weeds in a field. We have a solution, you know, chemical toxins that kill those organisms. Of course, we now know that those solutions create other problems. And so think about business, right? I mean, it's so often said, and I, and I know we all hear it, business is one of the problems in our society, has created so many problems in our society, whether it's around health or environment. And I look at those problems and I say, well, think about why can't that problem be a solution? Why can't business be the one that changes the way our, our health and, you know, the health trajectory we're on? Why can't business be the one to change what happens to our environment and to improve it? And I'll share with you a bit about how we do that. So, some, learn, some uh, lessons from China. Now I want to take you um, to a, another origin, source of origin. This is um, a, a Paraguay. We just, I was just there last month. Um, we have just launched a line of fair trade sweetened, fair trade, meaning using fair trade sugar uh, beverages. And so I had never, you know, of course I've been to the tea gardens, but I'd never been to where we buy sugar. And, and the fact is by weight, we buy more, even though we are very lightly sweetened or just a tad sweet, we still buy more sugar than any other ingredient just by pounds. So we buy several million pounds of organic sugar a year. And I wanted to gain a sense of what does it mean to buy organic? What's the difference between organic and, and non-organic? And, and then of course, between fair trades um, sweetened and not. So I'm gonna share with you a short video of um, this trip we took to Paraguay and you'll see what we learned along the way. We had a lot of goals when we launched Honest Tea. The first was to bring a low calorie drink to market and make it widely available. But another was to find ways to help connect people more closely to the natural world and to support ecosystems that are really under, under threat. And then another was to help bring economic opportunity to communities that often lack access to it. So we're in Paraguay, which is in the center of South America. It's bordered by Brazil, Argentina, and Bolivia. And Paraguay is the world's largest producer of organic cane sugar. So we've come here to gain a fuller appreciation of the communities and the ecosystem that help us bring this crop to market. Like that, it goes on my shoulder. <laughs> like that? I like to get my hands dirty, literally. I mean, obviously, I'm not working eight hours a day like these workers are in, in the field, but it helps make sure that I never take for granted all that's involved in, in you know, getting these products out of the earth and getting them into a, a bottle of tea. There we go. <laughs> Putting up the seed cane. It helps uh, start, the, start the, the germination. <laughs> What's his hope? What, what does he hope for in the future? Him and his wife, they have a small piece of land. And he's hoping that this uh, cane uh, will continue to exist. Sugar cane is a vital part of the Paraguayan economy. And each year, more farmers are making the switch to organic. It starts from the ground up with natural fertilizers cultivated in this compost field and continues in the lab where these researchers are developing alternatives to chemical pesticides by breeding tiny wasps to control cane worms. It's all part of our commitment to sustainable agriculture and growing communities. When we can see a school like this that really is supported by or a commitment to organic and fair trade, that really makes uh, a material difference in this community. Every time we buy a pound of fair trade sugar, a portion of our purchase goes back to the farmers. And sometimes these premiums are used to buy ambulances and modern farm equipment that helps the farmers increase yields. And sometimes they go to help community members who need an extra hand. We're seeing here Artemia and Anastasia and Sebastian. They live here. They have a small plantation of cane, organic cane. This is the original house that uh, this family lived in, and it, it 
It's a very basic construction, literally sticks and mud and a dirt floor. But they've been working in this field for 60 years. And so what's nice now is that the cooperative uh, provided them with a, uh, came and built a house for them. You know, it's so easy when you see a product on the shelf to just be disconnected, not only from the, the earth and the ecosystem it comes from, but also from the people involved. At the end of the day, making a better product is about more than just better taste. It's also about long-term investments in the environment, the farmers, and their communities. You know, it, it, for me, the, the two big rewards of, of this business have been connecting with consumers who we hear, you know, we really help them get on a, a, a different path with their health, and then getting to these communities where we sort of understand what kind of impact and, uh, we're able to have. And, and, and um, you know, when I used to go to these communities and it was some guy out of his house in Bethesda saying, I've got this idea and I'm really excited about it, they'd say, oh, that's nice, that's nice. Now when I go, it's the Coca-Cola company saying, this is where we're growing. This is the investment we're making in these communities. We want you to grow with us. We want you to be, whether you're not fair trade, we want you to you know, invest in uh, fair trade or organic. Um, as part of the growth. And so, you know, I, I go back to when I started, if, if you had told me, I, so 16 years ago, I guess 17 now, I was working at the Calvert Funds in Bethesda, Maryland. You know, Calvert was a leader, uh, still a leader in, in social and uh, environmentally responsible investing. And if you had told me, well, you'll still be living in Bethesda, Maryland, you'll, you'll um, be working for an organization that helps eliminate billions of calories from the American diet and helps to support the growth of organic agriculture and help to promote fair trade labor standards in the developing world, I said, oh, wow, that sounds like a great nonprofit or a great government entity. You know, I never would have guessed it could, would have been a beverage company, let alone one that today is owned by the Coca-Cola company, or one that delivered a 26-fold return to its original investors. But that's what we've been doing at Honest Tea, and uh, sometimes I still wake up in the morning and say, yeah, yeah, I, I'm selling beverages. It's, it's not exactly the path. I saw it to change, but it's been a really exciting one, one that I continue to be excited about. And it starts, as you heard, uh, in the classroom. So um, this is a picture from the comic book. The, the, this is the e-version, e which is in full color. The, 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 the hardback is in, I guess, three color. But Barry Nelbuff was my professor at the Yale School of Management. That's him in the top left. And that's supposed to be me in the bottom right. I actually had my first, just last month, I was walking out of a restaurant. Someone said, I recognize you from the comic book. So it was the first time. Someone... <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, um, so we were, I was in Barry's classroom and we were doing a case study of the beverage industry uh, and we were talking about the competitive dynamics and Barry said, look, when you go into a beverage aisle, there are hundreds of varieties, different colors, packages, flavors, names. Um, he says, but is there anything missing? And I said, well, there's all that diversity, but at the time, this was 1995, they almost all had the same calorie profile, they almost all had the same ingredients. There was nothing with one or two teaspoons of sugar. And I knew when I made tea at home, you know, I don't put five or six teaspoons in per serving, and maybe put one or a half teaspoon, sometimes none. How come no one was doing that in the beverage aisle? And so that was where the concept for Honest Tea came. It wasn't until um, 1997 when I uh, had gone for a run in Central Park, I was thirsty, and I came back from the run, I came back from the run and went to a beverage cooler, and I saw there was nothing there that I wanted that I reached out to Barry. And he had just come back from India, and he had been studying the tea industry, and he had come up with the name Honest Tea. And so for me, they kind of connected this idea, the opportunity, and the name. And so there's a funny story. When we registered for the name, we filed the, for two different trademarks. The first was Honest Tea, as you see it. But we also filed for H-O-N-E-S-T-E-A. And within a few weeks of after, after making that application, we heard back from Nest Tea's trademark lawyer, who said, well, we've seen your application, and..." You know, we're not comfortable with you marketing a product called Ho Nest Tea. And <laughs> so we said, well, when you put it that way, I don't think we're, we're comfortable marketing a product called Ho Nest Tea. And um, so we said, well, we'll withdraw that application if you let us keep Honest Tea, which that was uh, worked out for us. And of course, that would have been a very different book had, had that succeeded. So um, uh, I left my job at Calvert managed to get an appointment with a Whole Foods local buying office in Rockville, Maryland. Uh, we brewed five thermoses of tea in my kitchen, and I went to the buyer, and I got an empty Snapple bottle. We pasted a label on I said, we want to sell this in your store. And the buyer tasted it, and he understood why it was different. He said, yeah, yeah, no, this is great. We'll take 15,000 bottles. And 
that was a scary moment because we'd never made it anywhere but our kitchen. Um, so I'll share with you a bit about how we managed to figure that out. But we got into those stores and all we did that first summer was give out samples. We were, and I was in those stores. We gave out, uh, we gave out more samples than we sold. But by the end of the summer, we were the best selling tea in those 17 Whole Foods stores. And that was our launch pad to get into other Whole Foods regions, into other natural food stores. And then of course, because Whole Foods has been such a great um, driver of growth in the natural foods channel and, and driving of margin, other retailers started to take an interest and we grew from there. But one of the things we found really early on was that we were not for everybody, right? If you were drinking the, sweet, you know, the Snapple um, drink, then Honest Tea wasn't for you. But there were some people who weren't drinking that and for us, for them, Honest Tea was the only drink and this was the kind of uh, feedback we got. This was a voicemail we got from a consumer in Kalamazoo, Michigan. She went to our website. She thought, oh my gosh, I would beg to work at this company. I would move so I could work for your company. How responsible are you? That is just so everything. I wish you did everything. I wish you did my banking. I wish you were my neighbors. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love this product. I drink it every day. And then we had this guy out in California with a real honest tea tattoo. So there were some, some people who were really passionate about this. And that was so important for us because we were launching this business. It was me. Um, Barry didn't leave his day job. He was still a professor. So we had a few interns. And so the only people who could be our advocates in stores were our customers. And I, I actually got a call from one of the Whole Foods stores saying, you know, stop sending your mother into the store. We'll stock your product. And I said, my mother's up in New England. She can't, she's not good. But these people would go into the store and say, where's my honest tea? You know, it's not here. You're supposed to be carrying this product. And, and because we were so different, it wasn't like, you know, when that consumer went to the store with wanting to get honest tea, she wasn't going to go buy Snapple. If you're looking for 17 calories, you don't go say, oh, well, 17 calories is not here, so I'll go buy a 100 calorie drink. It was different enough that it was, we had a meaningful reason to be on the shelf and we had loyal consumers who weren't going to just settle for the next other option on the shelf. So then what happened was we got into the Whole Foods stores and that was exciting. Um, but we knew to really build a brand, we needed to get beyond just natural foods. We got into other local regional food stores. And so um, we went, <laughs> we learned quickly that um, distributors were really important. And I learned it most vividly. This is a you know, classic entrepreneurial story. So I, I had come up to New England. I, what I would do is rent a U-Haul truck, drive it up from Bethesda, Maryland, where we're based, pick up our tea. We, it's a long story why we had tea in New Jersey, but I pick up the tea in New Jersey. And then I would, um, make deliveries and I actually made a sale to, to the uh, legal seafoods, you know, we were gonna get a trial at the, in, in Prudential Center. So uh, after making that delivery, then I was with a classmate um, from, from college and we're driving through Harvard Square and I said, let's, you know, we gotta park the truck somewhere. Let's go, go, go into this garage. And he said, well, I don't think we should park in this garage. I said, why not? He says, well, you know, it says clearance, eight feet um, and we're in a 10 foot truck. I said, well, I, think, <laughs> I, said, I think we can make it. And, <laughs> You know, there's a saying, well, I, one of my sayings is sometimes eight feet really is eight feet. And uh, <laughs> sure enough, you know, the, the, that was a great classic example of where the entrepreneurial can-do spirit ran into an objective barrier, of, which is a height limit. So, so I knew I was not destined to be in the distribution business, and I'm so glad we have our, colleague, our partners from Coca-Cola of Northern New England who know not to drive a truck, you know, into a... 10 foot truck into it. <laughs> but for, uh, for me, that was like, okay, this is not, we're not going to build a national brand if I'm in charge of distribution. So we knew we had to get other distributors on board. And we went to other distributors. We would go to them and, you know, the, the, I, mean, I want to say the guys, because they were all guys who distribute Nantucket Nectars and Snapple and, and, and Arizona. And we got rejected in so many different ways. You know, they would say it wasn't sweet enough or it's, it's, it's too expensive or it tastes a bit like grass or the label's not flashy enough. One of the classics, and this is, this is true, um, and it actually was a distributor in New England we went to and they said, well, we need to make $5 a case. We sell Snapple, we make $5 a case. With your product, we only make $3.50 a case. And I thought about it, I said, well, wait a minute, Honest Tea is in 12 packs, 12 bottles to a case, and Snapple's in a 24 pack. So I said, wait a minute, you, you actually make $7 a case when you sell Honest Tea. He says, no, 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 see, you got two cases, but with Snapple, we have one case, we make $5 with one case. When, and, and so Barry said to me, he says, can I flunk this guy? I said, <laughs> I said you can flunk him, but he's not going to carry our product. Um, so it was one of those really uh, striking cases where the, the academic theory did not carry over into uh, reality. So what, as a result, we had to go to other distributors. We weren't getting in with the beverage distributors. So we had to find other ways to get to market. 
And what happened was we developed our own network of C distributors. And I, I call them C distributors not because that was their quality, but just because they all happened to start with the letter C. So I would go to the gourmet stores and um, initially, I was making deliveries. Like I said, they said, this, you know, this doesn't look, we're a premium gourmet store. You're driving up in your Saturn station wagon. It doesn't look, it's not the right look. So we ended up working with their cheese distributor to get to, to market. And then we went to the delis. There's a great restaurant in uh, Bethesda called Bethesda Bagels. We wanted them to carry the product, but he didn't um, work with our cheese distributor, so we ended up getting in with the corned beef distributor. <laughs> and then we went to the, the independent grocery stores um, they didn't work with either of those. We ended up working with, this is you know, the, the least predictable C, their charcoal distributor. <laughs> so any way we could get to the shelf was good enough for us. And we got to, um, to market and we started taking shelf space. And so then what happened was the beverage distributor said, look, this guy is taking our shelf space. Whether we carry it or not, we're gonna, why don't we start carrying it? So we started getting some of our calls returned. And that was a very fortunate uh, moment for us. Uh, on the one hand, it was fortunate. On the other hand, it's challenging because I'm sure you've all heard stories about it. It is a sharp-elbowed world. The beverage, distribu uh, beverage distribution market's very competitive. Um, these are products that turn over really quickly. So you know, when you go to a grocery store, um, you go to a Hannaford and you want to get uh, Raisin Bran, when the Kellogg's Raisin Bran sells out, you, they don't have to worry about post-Raisin Bran taking their shelf space. That, that, that space is slotted. Um, but in a beverage deli, you know, if Honest Tea sells out, um, it's kind of, it's often open season. Whoever gets there first gets that space. And so a lot of the independent beverage distributors are very um, tough folks to deal with. And I was trying to think about how to give you a, a feeling for that dynamic. And I'm going to, um, I thought the best way to do it, I'm going to actually play for you a, a brief voicemail that one of our sales reps got from uh, one of our distributors in New York City. I'll apologize in advance that it's a little coarse, but it is uh, for uh, educational purposes. So. Yo, Mike, this is Louie from Twisted Distributors. Look, all the things that you f up, if you don't handle that f***ing that works for you, bro, you could take your f***ing honesty and you could stick it up there and have those f***ing big You understand what I'm saying? I'm telling you, f*** you, f*** you honesty. You get the idea. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you already said you can't make that up, but... It's actually a really important lesson because here we are in a room and we all want to envision the ideal virtuous you know, economy. We want to start in the fair trade tea garden, move to the natural foods retailer, connect with a holistic consumer and be virtuous along the way. The fact is, our business is dependent on Louis. Like if we don't, if, and as you might guess, he's not motivated by the fair trade school in Paraguay. <laughs> So we need to really find, we have to deliver value to our partners every step along the way. Yeah, we can't be, a, this isn't a charity model. And, and same with our retailers. If, if our product's not moving, we lose our shelf space. It's not, it's not a question of them being uncharitable. We have to be, you know, it, it, that space is valuable. We have to deliver value to them. And so the irony is that Louis continues to be a very successful honesty distributor. Uh, and, 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 um, we benefit from, you know, the, he benefits from the fact that he makes $3.50 a case every time he sells our product. And for, for, you know, that in turn helps us support these communities we connect with and reach the consumers we want to connect with. And I think that's, uh, for us as a, as a community, as a, as a movement, we need to keep that in mind as well. So then what happened was we started getting enough independent distribution that we were getting really exciting opportunities, but we couldn't take advantage of them. So because we were selling well in the natural foods channel, we got approached by retailers like Safeway and, and Kroger who said, we like your product, we see what's happening in the natural foods channel, we want to take this to nationally. And we, we, un we were at a place where we couldn't deliver, literally. <laughs> Um, so Safeway said, well, I, I told Safeway, we've got distribution in the Mid-Atlantic, we've got, got distribution in California. They said, well, that's nice, but what about you know, the stores in Texas? What about the stores in Chicago? We didn't have an answer. So we got to a point where we needed to decide, are we gonna stay in our niche? Are we gonna stay strong and be the best selling to the natural foods channel? Or do we really wanna take the national opportunity that we have to, to, to drive change? And so we decided it made sense to do that. And we were being approached by really a, a lot of the different international food and beverage companies. And for us, Coca-Cola turned out to be the best partner, and I'll share with you why. So this was uh, a slide that Coke's management presented to their board um, for making the rationale, the case to invest in honesty. And this was back in 2007, and they talked about these big 
the mega trends, you know, not just the fads, not low carb diets, but where is society headed? And they talked about health and wellness, and environmental consciousness, and social responsibility, all being directions where society is headed. And if you were to look in 2007, that little white space where they all fuse together, relatively small space. But if you look five years out, or six or seven years out, the new standard for doing business will be that every company is expected to act and operate with all of those priorities in mind and try to make decisions that balance these accountabilities. And that's what the investment in honesty was about. And so for us, the investment was also um, attractive because they didn't want to buy Honest Tea right away. They wanted to invest and they became a minority investor. They bought 40% of the company in 2008 and Gary uh, Hirschberg stayed on our board along with Barry and we continued to build the brand. And so for three years we functioned as an independent operating company and then in 2011, as you heard, they bought the rest of the company. But because we had grown um, so well and, and um, with our, I'd say our brand intact, when it came time for Coke to exercise the option to buy the company, they said, let's not change any, anything that's going on here. Let's keep the management team in Bethesda. Let's let you continue to do what you're doing. And so now I'll share with you what that's meant. Well, first of all, um, the biggest impact has been around distribution. When we were in the natural, when, before Coke invested, we were in about 15,000 stores. Now we're in over 100,000 stores. So we, we talk about one of our core uh, missions is to democratize organics. You know, we always say, we didn't launch this business to sell healthy food to healthy people. We love healthy people, we love healthy food, but we're not achieving our mission if all we're doing is, you know, reaching people who either have the economic means or already the level of awareness to already, you know, to, to choose healthy and organic products. Our goal was to make our product line available to people who wouldn't necessarily think about buying organic or think about buying fair trade and to really bring this to a much wider population. And so that part of it has been an enormous impact. I mean, Coke is the world's largest beverage distribution system. And so we have a great opportunity to do that. So what about on the production side? So when we started, one of the big um, concerns I had was, would we be actually able to make this product? So I told you, um, you know, what we, when I sold it to Whole Foods, we hadn't made it at scale. But before that, I remember when I was getting ready to hand in my resignation at Calvert, I called Barry on the phone. I said, all right, um, you know, I'm going to go leave a good job at Calvert Group. I'm really, you know, just out of business school. We, my wife and I just had our third son. Um, are you really sure we can make this product? And so Barry said, well, well, how hard can it be? You just take a tea bag and you multiply times 10,000 and you got it. And once again, that's a case where academia doesn't necessarily convert to reality. So this was some pictures from our early production runs. And over here on the left, we had, we had a bottling plant. It was an apple juice packing plant up in Buffalo. And you can see in the corner here, these are these mesh bags. There's little wires on them. And we would put tea leaves in the bags and we dunk them in the tank. And we'd get about 18,000 bottles a day. There'd be about an inch and a half of tea leaf sediment on the bottom of the bottle. People used to ask me, well, am I supposed to chew that? Or, <laughs> so, well, it's not really supposed to be there. Um, then we evolved to this big tea steeper. This was sort of the, um, went into a tank about the size of a VW. Uh, and you would um, put tea leaves in there and spin that around. You get about 60,000 bottles a day. So people, uh, you know, at the time said, well, look, when Coca-Cola invests, they're not going to be able to work on a, that kind of small system. You know, what the Coke playbook usually is to find a way to make the product cheaper. Coke's going to try to take, you know, a powder or syrup, a concentrate, and add water to it and call that tea. And instead, we invested in these multi-million dollar tea brewing systems. This is me on the third floor of our tea brewing system in Northampton, Massachusetts, not too far away. And then this is our tea brewing system in Sacramento, California. Each of these uh, makes 500,000 bottles a day with better consistency, better clarity, still with real tea leaves, um, and better taste as well. So we managed to get production to scale with the same core ingredients intact. Well, what about innovation? How do we take that to scale? Well, one of the best innovations um, we've had at Honest Tea is for a line called Honest Kids. And this started when I was, um, my job, and uh, I'm not I'm much of a cook, but I do make school lunches for my three boys, or I did, they're all bigger now. And my middle son said to me, hey dad, I know you sell healthy drinks to grownups, but these, these juice pouches that you put in my lunchbox are really sugary. And I looked and there was more sugar in a juice pouch per ounce than in a, there is in a can of soda. And I realized that um, we could, why not take the same equities of honest tea, low sugar, organic, and put that into a kid's drink pouch. So we brought out the product called Honest Kids. And when we brought it out initially, this was in 2007, we sweetened it with organic cane sugar. And it started to do really well. It grew really quickly. 
And then we realized, well, wait, if, um, when a parent reads the ingredient panel, sugar is still the first ingredient. But what if we were able to sweeten it only with fruit juice? Now, nutritionally, it would still be the same, 40 calories, still 40 calories. But in 2013, we converted and we sweetened it with organic OU kosher white grape juice. And the reason I mentioned the OU kosher is because uh, it turns out there's um, only certain places you can get organic OU kosher white grape juice. We had to send rabbis to Turkey and uh, Argentina for the um, grape harvests. And we own more than uh, half of the world's supply of organic OU kosher white grape juice. But the result has been this line has just exploded. It is now more than a third of our business. Um, this year alone, it's growing. The category is down 6%. Honest Kids is up 42%. So we continue to really create value. And the other important lesson here, the juice pouch aisle was one totally driven by promotions. The only thing that would, you know, what, what determined what sold was whenever, who was ever was on special for, uh, you know, $2 a, a box is, is a 10 pack. Honest Kids went out at basically um, $4 for an eight pack. So really twice as expensive and still um, stole share because no one was giving parents the chance to invest in something better. And, and of course we know, you know, the biggest uh, driver to go organic is getting pregnant and having kids. So to be able to um, offer parents something better to offer their kids was, you know, whether they say parents, people will spend anything on their pets and their kids. Well, people were um, not being, having the chance to, to, to spend better on their kids. And the other interesting lesson here was that when we started working, Coca-Cola started distributing this through the Minute Maid system. And somebody uh, one day said, you know, we did some tests around Honest Kids and we found out it's not the preferred drink among kids. I said, well, you wasted your money. I said, I could have told you that. There's no self-respecting kid who's gonna say, I like a 40 calorie drink more than a 100 calorie drink. But guess what? If that's what's in their lunchbox and that's the only thing in their lunchbox, guess what they're gonna drink? And, and they may not care for it on Monday. Tuesday, they may get used to it. By the end of the week, by Friday, they're used to it. And you've changed the palate of that consumer. And, and, and so it's really been exciting. And this is, this is a product line we don't do any advertising for. You know, you really, you can't, we can't uh, collectively advertise to kids. So it's viral. It's one where you go to the soccer game or you go to the birthday party and honest kids is there and your parents see it and others see it as well. So it's, it's a really exciting to see how that product line has grown. And so, uh, other innovations, we brought out larger bottles, these multi-serve bottles, uh, and then also a line called Honest Fizz, a zero calorie naturally sweetened soda, and then also a fresh brewed um, tea so it can be sold in, in restaurant settings as well. And if you look at our growth, you can see that it has been a, there's a nice curve to it. <laughs> Nicely. All along the way, it's, it's been driven by innovation. So whether it's with the first to do the low calorie, first to do organic, first to do fair trade, first to do um, reduced packaging, to think about um, uh, honest fizz, different innovations. For us, it's always about our innovation drives our growth. And we, we, we uh, innovate because we need to grow. We innovate because we need to take our mission to the next level. And of course, along the way, we've certainly had our share of failures. We had a tea bag line that didn't work. We had a line called Coco Nova. Anyone taste that one? One person, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. Uh, aside from that, with the exception of Justin, no one else really tasted it, and that was, that was the reason it didn't work. Um, <laughs> but we're not afraid to innovate. We have to continue to innovate if we're gonna continue to find new opportunities. And so what are some of the big trends? Why, why is this working? Why are you in the right room? Well, you know, the Cone Communication Survey from, from 2013, um, nine in 10 consumers said they'll stop buying a product if they feel they're being deceived. And how do we build trust? So labeling of key product and inf nutritional information, images from farms and production facilities, a website that honestly and transparently answers questions, leaders explaining how food is produced. And so these are some of the things we're trying to do. And actually, I should say the beverage industry as a whole has really been proactive around labeling the clear on calories, um, other or you know, certainly the, whether it's organic or uh, issues around fair trade, when we can share images of what's going on in our communities. And then every year we put out a, a mission report and it is on our website, uh, we talk about. And, it, and I always say the mission report cannot be a cheerleading document. The goal isn't to pat ourselves on the back, it's to challenge ourselves. And I know Timberland's done a great job as well. It's to say, here's where we're falling short, here's what we need to do. And, and frankly, uh, actually this is a, to give you a sense of Barry, who's just a very creative alternative thinker, I was with Barry, we were doing our book tour, and somehow I think we were doing something where we were seated, and Barry had these really wild, brightly colored socks, and so the moderator said to Barry, Barry, what's with the socks? He said, well, as a professor, 
um, I figure people are going to make fun of you one way or the other. So I'd rather have their attention focused on my ankles. <laughs> and so with Honest Tea, our point of view is, look, we've got flaws. There's no company, there's no such thing as a socially responsible company. There's no company that's doing things perfectly. Better for us to be out there exposing all our flaws and being honest and transparent about them than, you know, to have someone, you know, saying, oh, they're not, they're dishonest tea. So for us, it's really an important way to, to live up to um, our, our name. Some of the, one of the other things we've been doing, and it's really, um, we're right in the middle of it, is our great recycle tour. And so we have, uh, look, our biggest environmental impact is our package, right? We're, we're, we're generating millions, hundreds of millions of single-use containers that are recyclable, but most, for the most part are not recycled. And so we have to take a role uh, in making sure they are recycled. And how do we do that? So we have um, this great recycle tour. We have these large bins uh, that we bring. There's both a 30-foot high bin and a 12-foot high bin. We go all around the country. We set up bins and we get to we attract people to these events by offering them premiums and we get to educate them on the ground and talk to them about recycling, what, what you can do, what, you, what can be recycled, what, what shouldn't be recycled. Um, and just last month we collected over 100,000 bottles uh, around the country through our Great Recycle Tour. So another way for us to be, uh, you know, hopefully involved in, in part of the solution. Then how else do we create awareness? Well, back in the beginning when we started, um, our marketing, as I said, was giving out samples. And that worked when we were in 17 stores. It even worked when we were in a few thousand stores because we, we really could get to the largest retailers. But when you get to 100,000 stores, you can't reach everybody you want to reach. And we know our best sale is when we can look someone eye to eye and, and talk about the brand. And Adrian is here from our team in charge of our, all of our marketing. And, and so that's what she does. Um, but we can't reach everybody that way. So we have to find proxies. We have to find other ways to connect with consumers. And I want to share with you one of the, uh, our most popular experiments. It's called the National Honesty Index. We set up these racks of tea around the country. And there's a sign that says the honest store. It's a dollar a bottle. It's an honor system. There's no cashier. There's no visible personnel. There's no visible cameras. And then we just step back and we want to see what happens. So I'm going to show you what happens with this social experiment. But before I do, any, any guesses? How, what percent of people do you think would put money in the box? It just, how honest do you think people would be? 80%? Okay. So we're going to play the video. You'll get to see. But in addition to watching the results, think about this also as a marketing uh, investment. Just how honest are you in public if no one has their eyes on you, or at least you think they don't? America's honesty has been put to the test using data gathered from experiments conducted in all 50 states. The company behind Honest Tea set up an unmanned kiosk all across the states. Those kiosks offer drinks for a dollar on the honor system. All while secretly recording. Did you pay a dollar or are you a liar? A social experiment is actually underway. Our company seeks to have this honest and direct relationship with our natural ingredients. And so we always wanted to test how much does the um, American consumer embody those same values? Did you get a tea? No, I didn't. I don't have any cash. And I feel guilty not taking it <laughs> In some situations, you know, we actually had some people who tried to walk away with a rack of tea just to see what, you know, if anyone would call them out, and, wow. and no one did. And in yes. some states, your experiment really paid off. Alabama, Hawaii, 100% of the people paid. Isn't that impressive? We track observable characteristics such as male, female, if you have a hat on. <laughs> Someone put a $5 bill in and all they took was one drink, so they said they were extra honest. There's some beauty in the honor system when it works, it really is. The District of Columbia, they were the lowest. So those politicians in Washington, only 80% of them were yeah. honest. To add insult to injury, our office is based uh, very nearby, so I actually um, mm. took the metro in, and, and when I got back to the metro, my bike had been stolen, so. Oh. <laughs> and you paid. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Someone else took the tea and then sent you a letter with money inside later <laughs> apologizing. Yeah. So obviously yeah. there's remorse out there. Based on the numbers from last year, uh, it was 
really honest. It was mostly between 90 and 100 percent honest, and it kind of makes you feel good about society and you know the way we're headed. So you know what's funny about that? Think if, if we were trying to get. Um, people in Anchorage, Alaska, on the Anchorage, Alaska Evening News to talk about honesty. I don't know how we would do it, but this was a way. And we've been doing that now. This is, it'll be our fifth year this year. Every year we do it a little bit differently, so there's still news to it. But um, it's, it's a great example of how you can, you don't need the big budgets of the big companies to still create awareness. Um, so I want to give you some closing thoughts and then we can open it up for a discussion. But I, I started talking about China and I want to end with, with two of my favorite proverbs from China. Uh, the first is, if we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. Well, when you look at where we're going, it is not the right direction. Um, the United Nations ranks every few years, they rank the average life expectancy of all the countries in the world. There's about 200 countries. And so even though the United States is the wealthiest nation in the history of the world, even though we have more advanced knowledge of science and medicine than any civilization has ever had, when the UN ranked the average life expectancy of all the countries in the world, we weren't number one, we weren't number two. We were number 40. So what does that say about our lifestyles, about our diets, about our relationship to the natural world, about our relation to, to each other? It's totally off. And not just, you know, we're not just sort of, oh, just outside the top 10, we're number 40. When we have the means and the knowledge and the capability to be number one. So how do we change that? Well, that's what we're all in this room for. You know, the big companies aren't going to make that change. That, in a lot of ways, are, they're invested in that direction. The government isn't really <laughs> capable of doing that, and I don't think they should be. It's when entrepreneurs and, and innovators can bring different approaches to market. And when they succeed, and we know they don't all succeed, but when they succeed, the big companies will buy in. And so it's a great opportunity to make change. It's also a great business opportunity. You've got the wealthiest nation in the history of the world with the 40th ranked average life expectancy. It also means you know, poor quality of life. So if you can create a way for people to live better, live longer, and they have the means to do that, I'd invest in that every day. So that's a great business opportunity. It's a great impact opportunity. And what does it all mean? How does it all, for us, what does it all come down to? Well, starting with what we talked about at the grassroots level, when Coke first invested in Honest Tea, the year before they invested, we bought 800,000 pounds of organic ingredients. Last year, we bought over 5 million pounds. This year, we'll buy over 8 million pounds. So now, as I said, when we go to these communities, it's not just some guy out of his, you know, working out of his house saying, I really want to help you, you know, realize an opportunity. And what's exciting, when I can go to Paraguay and see how these communities are invested, just a few weeks after being in Paraguay, I went um, to the Dominican Republic because my, my son plays baseball and we had a, he had a tournament there. And I was walking through a town, it was, used to be a, I say used to be a sugar mill town, the mill had closed because they didn't have organic uh, sugar. And so when the it's a commodity market, in a commodity market when there's a price swing, you know, the commodities, the, 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 the per person who couldn't compete got cut out. But in Paraguay, where they have organic sugar, they basically have a way to be able to, to generate both a, a market protection and a premium for their community. The other ways that um, we think about what we're doing for us, the book really is an important way to, to, to spread the mission. I'm very thankful to Coca-Cola of Northern New England for, for sponsoring the purchase of the books because we want to spread this ethos. And uh, just like Honesty isn't a business as usual business, this shouldn't be a business as usual business book, uh, which frankly I'm willing to bet many of us have opened and then not finished. And so we wanted this book to be accessible, not just to the entrepreneurs, though it, it certainly is and the lessons are, but to other people who wouldn't necessarily consider themselves entrepreneurs. I, I say that business is too important to leave to business people. We've got to get people who are creative, who are social change agents, thinking about how they can be involved in business. And so I've, I've, you know, what, it started from the fact that my oldest son is dyslexic. He had, um, so he's always gravitated towards comic books. And his senior year of high school, he'd gotten into college. He was definitely officially in his senior slump. Uh, he was bringing home comic books. And my wife said, you better make sure he keeps his grades up or he's you know, not, gonna not be able to keep his acceptance to college. And so I'd go upstairs and try to talk to him. I, I have a business book I was trying to read and, and he'd have his comic book and then I kept 
you know, my wife would come upstairs, we'd both be reading his comics <laughs> together. And I realized a comic book can be a really visual, engaging way to tell a story. Why couldn't we tell a business story that way? And so um, for us, that's what this honest, the mission in a bottle is about. As you heard, I have a co-founder, Bethesda Green, which is our local sustainability initiative in Bethesda. Um, happy Family or Happy Baby is an organic baby food company that I was on the board of. It just sold last year, once again, based on the insight that organics is the biggest trigger um, you know, uh, getting pregnant and having kids is the biggest trigger to going organic, so that was a, um, a very successful company. And then Beyond Meat is a company I've just recently joined, but a real one I'm very excited about as well. And let me just give you um, two closing thoughts. So, um, you know, we're still in touch with our, that supplier in China, the one in Abwe province. And so, um, just we have a director of mission who, who connects with them more regularly, and she said, Oh, you know, I just heard that you'll never guess what they. Uh, they bought in that community, and I'm like, oh no! They, you know, because with our fair trade proceeds, they get a producer fund they can spend things on for the community priorities. I said, oh, I hope they didn't build a bridge because they're going. <laughs> they actually bought a, a more sturdy boat. So, the <laughs> um, but here's here's one other closing thought. Um, this is not easy work. Uh, if you're if you are challenging the status quo, either from a business perspective or from a, a mission perspective, it is challenging work. Um, if it were easy, it would have already been done. And, and someone was reading the book and they said, gosh, that book read like a horror story. I mean, <laughs> there were a lot of challenging moments. I, I, uh, one of my favorite scenes, so just after we had um, sold into Whole Foods, I was at a family picnic having a piece of pizza and I felt something hard in my mouth. And I said, well, there's not supposed to be anything you know, crunchy in pizza. It was my tooth that had cracked. So I went to the dentist and she said, no, I can tell you're grinding your teeth at night. Are you under any stress? <laughs> I said, yeah, I guess you could say that. I said, well, you got two options. You can try to, you know, do sleep therapy, you know, turn the lights low, play the soft music, do yoga before you go to bed, or I can just fit you for a night guard and your teeth will still grind, but there'll be that buffer there. I said, I think I'm going to need the night guard. <laughs> and I, I still wear a night guard uh, because it's still challenging work, right? Now we're, we've got a, we aren't just mission-driven entrepreneurs. Now we're trying to build a mission-driven company inside a profit-driven economy. Um, and there's those who say, just as there were those who said in the beginning, you can't build a beverage business in a, in a huge industry where there's you know, such competitive forces. Um, there are those who say you can't build a mission-driven business inside a large multinational. And for both of those people, I'll, I'll close with this, this quote. This is uh, on the wall of Honesty's office. Those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. And if you're in this room, you're one of the people doing it. So I want to thank you for listening and hope you'll join me in this movement. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>